Thanks for that introduction, and thank all of you for making it out in this other slash Friday. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, yeah, so the work I'm going to talk to you about today is called Automatic Generation of Efficient Parallel Streaming Hardware, which is a little outside of, I think, a lot of your topic areas, but hopefully I'll be able to sort of make the connections um, that will keep you interested in it. And so um, because it's a little outside of the topic area, I wanted to invite everyone to, if there's something you don't understand, raise your hand during the presentation, let me know, so I can keep everyone engaged and on the same page and everything. So my talk is sort of broken down. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on sort of the type of problem I'm working on. Um, I'm going to start with an analogous problem that's not actually in the domain I'm working on, but I think is more relatable to everybody. Um, going to discuss exactly what I'm looking at. And then I was going to give uh, the, the two main uh, topics that I'm working on, but I think in the interest of time, I might skip the second one. And then I'm going to give you uh, some concluding remarks and some future directions that um, can be going in this. So suppose you have a problem such as this. You have a, you're a the owner of a car company, and you get a pre-order of 500,000 cars that you need to deliver in one year's time. And you have a production assembly line that can generate 100,000 cars per year. And so you have the problem of you need to expand your capacity in order to uh, meet this deadline. Well, how do you go about expanding this capacity? You know, there's a number of options. One, you can increase the speed of your assembly line. Um, so this is analogous to what I'm working on in digital, digital circuits where you could increase the clock speed. Um, an alternative is you could put in multiple production lines. Um, you know, so instead of one production line of 100,000 cars per year, have five production lines generating 500,000 cars per year. Um, but the problem gets a lot more complicated, and this is sort of where uh, my research lies when you consider things like, what about if some of these cars are customized? So you have you know, parts that go on some cars but not others, and they're sort of intermixed within the production line, and then you have constraints with uh, the size of your factory. Maybe you don't have space for the full five production lines, or you don't have space for some of the components that need to be um, sitting next to the production line in order to uh, customize your car. So those are some of the problems I have to deal with. So our goal is to sort of um, automatically generate these parallel production lines and sort of share resources as much as possible and speed up the production lines as much as possible. Is that, okay. So <laughs> I can see Tad, he, he, he's, he's skeptical. Um, so I said one of the methods of, of speeding up production was you could increase the clock frequency or increase the speed of the production line. One of the problems with doing that today is, um, if you look at this graph, this is the clock frequency of basically desktop processors from 1985 until 2012, roughly, from a couple of the major manufacturers. And you can see here, this is on the logarithmic scale, from about 1985 up to 2002, 2003, there was basically exponential growth in clock speed. And so basically, during that time period, if you needed to uh, increase uh, your data processing speed, your production, all you had to do was just wait a couple of years and you sort of got it for free. You didn't have to change your algorithm one bit. It was nice and easy. And since about 2003, uh, the clock rate is sort of stagnated. It, it's hovering around about 3 gigahertz or so. And that's increased a little in the last few years. but. Um, Nonetheless, you're not going to get exponential growth like we used to see. And so in order to um, do digital so signal processing at a faster rate, um, we basically have to turn to alternatives such as parallelism. Now, that's sort of where the analogy with the assembly line lies, and that you could put in multiple um, assembly lines, parallel streams, processing. So I'm, go I'm sort of going to break the idea of parallelism into sort of two types. So the first type... Yeah, I'm going to call temporal parallelism. And the idea here is, is basically the assembly line type concept where you have, um, we refer to it as streaming, where you have data that comes in 
uh, at each clock period or each time at epoch, goes into the first stage, the first stage does some computation or processing on it, and then everything shifts. So the first stage gets a new sample and does some operation, and then the second stage does a second operation. So in this figure, this is um, sort of what the assembly line looks like for an FFT-type algorithm where you have these radix 2 butterflies um, in series uh, generating the FFT output. And the problem with this uh, concept is you're sort of limited to the clock rate. Uh, just like with the car assembly line, you're only going to get one car out each, uh, each clock cycle, or each time epoch if you're on a, a car assembly line. And so that's great if your clock frequency is increasing like it was until 2003, but now clock rate is sort of staying still. So how, how do we um, handle that? How do we get more data processing for the same the same concepts. So, you know, consider this fast Fourier transform. You have an FFT that's running at 100 mega samples per second. You know, it can be an assembly line type concept or something else. It really doesn't matter, but that's the throughput it can handle in terms of data, right? And then you have a FIFO that's before it. And it has a input data rate here of 200 mega samples per second. But the FFT can only run at 100 mega samples per second. So if you sort of consider uh, going down each uh, square at a time step, one clock, on the first clock period, you're going to get two samples, x0 and x1. On the second time period, the FFT is going to take one sample out of the, the FIFO, but the FIFO is going to get two more samples. So then well, by the time you get to the fourth time uh, clock, you have run out of space in this FIFO. There was only four spaces, and so you have an overflow. So if any of you have worked with, you know, FFTs and, you know, spectrum, looking at the spectrum, you have gaps in the data that you're going to get um, these big spikes in your uh, output, and no one wants to deal with that. It's not going to work. So, uh, so are you saying that the, the current method is just like the internet. If, if you're overloading, you just drop um, packets on the floor. So for example, in this case, uh, once your FIFO overflows, you would drop sample 7, and then let's say that by the time sample 8 arrives that uh, your FIFO is open. You, is, that, that, is that the type of gap you're talking about? That's the type of gap I'm talking about. And, and you can, you know, imagine you can make the FIFO bigger, but it really doesn't matter at some point. It's going to be unstable because you're, you're still produ you're, you're providing way too much information based on how quickly you can um, process it. Exactly. So we need to basically make the output rate equal the input rate. That's, that's what we need to do. So as I mentioned before with the assembly line, let's suppose we just create two separate assembly lines. We have FFT1 and we have FFT2. They're both running at 100 mega samples per second. So that's a rate of 200 mega samples per second. So we should be all good, right? Well, if you just you know consider the, the even samples going to FIFO1 and the odd samples coming to FIFO2, and this is sort of how they would come out from like a standard like analog to digital converter in continuous time. You would get two samples each clock cycle or more, potentially, um, but they would be in time order. So you have um, the samples going, even samples going into FIFO2, one odd samples going into FIFO2, but the FFT, again, requires that the samples be continuous in time. So if the FFT1 is acting on just the even samples, you're not going to get the spectrum you are expecting. It needs samples you know, 0 through 8 if it's a size 8 FFT or 0 through N, whatever that N you would like. So how do, we, how do we handle that? And so this is sort of getting into the, the guts of what I'm working on. Is um, So on the top figure, this is sort of the uh, data flow for FFT of size 8. I don't know if you maybe were familiar with it. But um, highlighted is the first uh, computation, the first radix 2 butterfly that needs to occur. And if you look, um, x0 and x4 basically need to be added and subtracted to, from each other. But uh, on the bottom figure, 
x0 and x4 are located in the same input stream, but at different time instances. And in order to add and subtract them, they basically need to be um, in two different streams, both at the t same time instance, uh, sort of as shown in the, in the middle. That's what they need to look like. And so in order to uh, accomplish this, um, you need to be basically be able to swap data between the two data streams, and you also need to change um, the temporal aspect to it in that you need to shift um, x4, which is in the second clock cycle, into the first clock cycle on the output side of things. And uh, just to note, this type of um, reordering of data is uh, called a stride permutation. It's also known as uh, corner uh, shift permutation, but it shows up in things like FFT, matrix transposes, um, some other linear transforms. It's fairly common. Um, so applications this applies to. I gave you the example of an FFT, but it also shows up in a number of places in signal processing. Anytime you're doing a matrix multiplication, you might uh, need to permute the data. Linear transforms, like the discrete sine and cosine transforms, the Hadamard transform, um, also shows up in their uh, correction, like LDPC codes, Viterbi decoding, and can also show up in machine learning, uh, such as neural network processing. There's a lot of matrix multiplication and um, things that go on in there. So we're trying to generate these architectures to uh, have these high throughput uh, data processing. And there's a number of ways you can measure how efficient you're actually being. So, these include how fast are you, what kind of throughput you get, uh, the latency, how long does it take from when data enters the system to when it exits the system, uh, area and resource cost, how much logic, how much memory are you taking up in your, in your um, with digital logic, and then energy efficiency, how much power does it take to process this. And all of these might, you know, depending on your application, depending on your application, um, be more important or less important to you. And we specifically looked in this work at um, basically constraining the throughput, so saying you know we have a certain input clock rate and uh, data rate coming in, and so we want to be able to process at that data rate. So we constrain the data rate, the throughput, and then um, we specifically looked at minimizing the latency through the system, and the reason we looked at minimizing latency is because uh, latency is related to some of these other aspects like area and resource costs because the, um, the number of stages of the pipeline is the number of, uh, related to the latency and the less stages pipeline you have, the less um, sort of logic that you need in order to implement these things. And then less logic, the less energy. Now that's kind of hand wavy. There's, you know, things can vary a little bit if you're, um, if you need to do more operations in order to reorder the data. Maybe you're not quite as energy efficient, but that's sort of our motivation for why we specifically focused on latency. And of course, there's some applications where latency is really important. If you're doing communications link and you are um, you, you need to do low latency um, transmit and receive. You know, you receive a pack and you need to reply. Maybe latency is a constraint there. Um, so moving on, now that I've sort of given you a little idea of what I'm working on, um, we're trying to basically exploit both this temporal parallelism I mentioned with the uh, spatial parallelism and then um, generate architectures that can maintain a certain throughput and do this auto all automatically. So our algorithms are designed that you can basically hit a button and say, I want to generate this type of um, architecture hit the button and it does it all for you. So uh, the first big section of work is in the area of permutations. I already sort of mentioned it with the FFT, um, but that stride permutation is just one specific permutation. So I was specifically looking at arbitrary permutations, and they're arbitrary in a couple of ways. One, the permutation size is arbitrary, arbitrary n. So, um, and a lot of work, they 
have constraints on these sizes, like the permutation has to be a power of two. Streaming width has to be a power of two. And by streaming width, it's basically like the number of samples each clock, or the number of production lines. Those have to be a power of two. Um, and I remove those constraints completely. You can have arbitrary size n and arbitrary streaming width k. Um, and then specific things that I uh, focused on in this work is I developed lower bounds for the amount of memory that's required in the data path in terms of how many, how, the size of the RAM array and their depths. Um, and then I developed a algorithm and actually a, a computer aided design tool that will actually generate these architectures automatically for you. So you talk about permutations. Uh, yes. You just, a simple example would be a 1024 size FFT. Um, if you were to count the number of permutations, that's what that's, um, um, that, that's a pretty big number, is it not? That would be um, arbitrary size n and then stream width. Uh, so from a counting perspective, that's a very big space you're looking at. It is a big space. And so how do you sort of, um, do, do you do a, an exhaustive search of that space to find the ideal way to parallelize your architectures? Uh, is it a brute force search? Or, or how does your, is your algorithm able to, to like maybe um, toss out or, or restrict that search space to make it quicker? So what search space are you indicating in terms of the stream width? Uh, so, uh, you know, it, it, this sounds like what you're doing is you, you, you take all these different permutations of the way that you could look at your data set <coughs> and you're trying to find the, um, those permutations, like for example, the zeroth element <coughs> and the fourth element uh, have a correlation as part of the, the compute step. Yes. Uh, and then find the, 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 what's the permutation that gets this done the quickest? Okay. Uh, and so it, that sounds like that is a traditional search. So that's a good question. That's actually not what I was discussing here. I actually have a paper that does address that okay. question of how do you, um, you only care about x0 going with x4, maybe you don't need those to be in that particular spot. So yes, I have a paper that um, looks at that aspect of it, and not to go too far in depth, but basically the method I use to, to search that space, which is very large, is uh, I use a, a greedy approach. Okay, cool. Yeah, but yeah, good question. That was something, um, yeah. So I'm sort of assuming with this work that you're giving me the particular permutation that you want. Okay. But it could be any type of permutation. You know, basically a set of n numbers, you reorder it however you want. So from a counting perspective, is it a permutation? Would it be um, the number of options times, you know, raised to a particular power? Uh, or is it something like a combination? Or um, um, can you sort of describe the, uh, the, the counting principle you're using for this? Or is, is it... Um, uh, so it is a permutation, not a combination. Okay. That was actually, the combination was more in what I would have talked to given more time. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it is a permutation that each element that's on the input gets used a single time on the output. Okay. Cool, great. Okay. So going back to the, the stride permutation, just because it's easily relatable, um, the, the figure basically shows on the top is what it would look like if you just, you know, what the permutation is. You have seven elements, x0 through x7, and you're applying the stride permutation of uh, four. So as before, x0 goes with x4, x1 goes with x5. The, the stride of four is the difference between the two numbers. So x1 plus four is x5, x2 plus four is x6, so forth. That's what stride uh, indicates here. Um, so. My tool would basically take this input as, okay, you have the first, uh, your input is x0 through x7, and you want the output x0, x4, x1, x5, and so forth. And you want a architecture that has a stream width of two. And, and then that looks like the bottom figure where you have data going in in this fashion, x0, x1 in the first clock cycle, x2, x3 in the second, and then on the output, x0, x4, x1, x5. 
So this is sort of the, what the, the general architecture looks like. You have a P2P connection network, and I'll define all what these uh, undefined variables are in a bit. Uh, P2P connection network, and that basically can permute the data in space. So it takes in P data elements and it can re reorder them space-wise. And then it goes into this array of uh, memory elements and that can basically reorder them um, temporally, shift the, um, the output time. Um, and then finally it goes through another connection network that's P2P. And you might think, well, why do you need two connection networks? Well, the reason for that is because if you only have one connection network, what can happen is you might run into a situation, and in fact it often happens, where you have a memory conflict, where you need to read two elements from one of the memory arrays, but you don't have two ports on your memory array, and so you can only access one element at a time and you have a memory conflict. Um, but using the two networks, it's provable that you can um, avoid these conflicts. So, in terms of minimizing uh, the latency in the memory, um, we want to do two things. One, we want to minimize P, uh, reduce the number of memory elements needed in this array, and we want to minimize the memory depth, D. Um, so the way we sort of approach this problem is we represented everything as a, in a graphical structure. So each time instance on both the input and output gets assigned to a node. Um, so x0 and x1 gets assigned to input node 0. And uh, for the output, sam the output samples x0 and x4 get assigned to output node 0. And then a edge is drawn between any node that contains the same data sample. And note, um, the output nodes occur at a time uh, TL, and the L represents the latency through this data path. And we'll, we'll find out what L is in a little bit. So I said we wanted to minimize the array size P. What we can do, because we have this graph, is we can apply uh, some theorems from graph theory. Specifically, you can apply a Koenig's line coloring theorem, which states that if you have a bipartite graph, the The number of colors needed to properly edge color the graph is equal to the maximum degree of the graph. And you can make the connection that the edges are equivalent to the memory arrays, and by coloring them, you're assigning each element to a particular memory array. And so if uh, no, no node has more than a single color, as a color isn't repeated on that node, you're not accessing any memory array twice any single memory array twice. I guess it's assumed that for all those T sub L's, uh, L for each each unique T is constant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, you, so you can apply a Koenig's line coloring theorem to this and make the connection that um, the maximum degree is going to uh, give you the number of memory elements that you need. And because this is uh, two inputs uh, per clock cycle, two outputs per clock cycle, uh, it's bipartite because you have the input nodes and you have the output nodes. You can apply this and determine that um, the P is going to have to be greater than or equal to K. And so we choose P equal to K to minimize the number of memory elements. And that sort of squishes the graph. Uh, not the graph is fair. And then um, we want to actually assign each element to a particular memory. Okay. We want to actually assign each data element to a particular me memory array. And so the way we do that is basically the next step in graph theory of actually assigning colors to each edge. And so uh, the method I show here is based on Euler partitions. And the way this works is you basically start at a you know, you pick a node, start at any node, and then you follow an edge to the next node, and then try not to return, take the next edge to any node that you haven't previously visited until you can't go any further. 
So if you move to the second um, graph to the, from the left, uh, this has been done in two different colors. So you, you create two subgraphs. The one is in red and the one is in uh, cyan. Those are the two Euler partitions. And then the labeling is done by just taking each of those subgraphs and alternating colors for each subgraph. So on the left, uh, that's equivalent to the red subgraph. Sorry. This one is equivalent to the red subgraph there, and this one is equivalent to the cyan subgraph there. So because the maximum degree of this particular graph was four, we have four colors. And so so what does the Euler partition do? Uh, the Euler partition, it's, um, it basically breaks breaks your graph into subgraphs, each with maximum degree 2, which makes it very easy to color. And you can do it fairly efficiently and quickly. Algorithmically. Yes? Do you use this method to count for, for the architecture that need more than two inputs in Yes, absolutely. I was just using two as a as a sort of simple example, but yeah, this applies to any number of inputs and outputs. And it uses suboptimal best solution, right? Or it's going to be optimal? Uh, it's going to be optimal in terms of number of uh, memory elements that you need. Okay, so I mean, if I choose another partition other than all other partition, I I would definitely get a worse performance. Uh, not necessarily. So you're going to get the same number of colors used for any of the, the possible um, algorithms, but the terms of speed may, may differ in terms of how fast the algorithm actually runs. There's a whole field of, of work on, on different algorithms to, to run this more efficiently. Um, some of the original ones were uh, by a guy called Gabao and then late 60s, and then there were some improvements in the early 70s um, by Alon, and, uh, but they're more sort of computer science improvements in terms of um, data structures and stuff to, to store partial resor results and access them quickly. Just from mapping to Harbor, so for, for all these PDP networks, I've noticed that each node uh, is connected to all, so all the inputs are connected to all the outputs in the in the, in the leftmost graph, so the one that's all black. In this one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. In, uh, in your previous examples, you, you've been talking about there are only certain inputs that will be connected to certain outputs. And so with this, um, yeah, um, exactly, you mentioned the, you know, the stride and, and Right. You mentioned that, um, like in, in your particular examples, inputs may correspond to two outputs. Uh, but with that graph, it's, it's so when you essentially partition, yes. um, and when you color those edges, uh, what's the relevance to um, the, uh, I would say, I'm not sure, I think it's the, the spatial correlation of the inputs is in, for example, in the FFP, element zero and element four have that, have that correlation as opposed to uh, from from the, the edge coloring example, it's almost uh, it's difficult for me to figure out how you are getting the the memory mapping when uh, that your initial map on the left is just it's it's every node to or every input node to every possible output node. It's, it's like you're you're hitting every possible permutation of that. Yeah. And then how do you select the uh, I guess the the permutations that are relevant to the the temporal uh, structure in the, in, in your input data. Okay. Maybe I skipped too far ahead. No, I, I see where you're going there, I think. Um, so yeah, maybe, number one, it sounds like maybe that maybe it would be better to use this as an example of this graph. Because um, yeah, that, that graph is, yes, it's, uh, I forget the term, but it's, it's, com it's, it's connected. completely connected. Yeah, completely every, connected. Every, every input's connected to every output. So you have, I think that was a, it was, it was four, yeah. Yeah, it was four. So. Yeah. Um, there are cases where you could you could potentially see something like this. Um, it really it, the actual like assignment isn't necessarily that important as long as there are, 
Is this an assignment? Okay, so this is more saying that we can build a network regardless of what the uh, input criteria is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So we've assigned um, a RAM element to each of these uh, data elements, and this basically, I'm not going to go into the details, but once you've assigned this, you can basically set up the um, control structures to make those assignments uh, actually happen. Uh, the other thing I wanted to minimize was the memory depth and also the sort of the latency and they're related. Um, so going again back to this graph, you can sort of take some concepts from synchronous data flow, uh, very trivial examples from synchronous data flow, in that um, each output node can only execute once its inputs are available, have entered the memory. So that is equivalent to this constraint up on the top left. Uh, where I'm basically saying tau, the execution time of output node i, has to be greater than or equal to the maximum execution time over all of the input nodes that share edges with that output node. So the notation uh, capital N of O of i is the neighborhood of O of i, so all the nodes that have edges connected to it. And I think that should make intuitive sense. You can't output something that you haven't received. Um, so this algorithm is um, basically set, sets up um, <coughs> execution times that <coughs> meet all of the constraints. So I mentioned you have to meet this, uh, this, this constraint in the top left. You also have to meet constraints such as each output node can only execute <coughs> one time instance. It doesn't make sense to you know, squish everything in the same time instance. Another thing is that you need to have all of the nodes execute as a group, continuously one after another. And the reason for that is if there was a gap between output nodes 0 and 1, say, then it would take five clock cycles to output all of your uh, output data, and it only took four clock cycles to input all of your input data, which basically, again, is a discrepancy between input data rate and output data rate. So you would, again, have a state where um, you're filling up memory and eventually dropping data. So the first loop, uh, the first for loop, basically sets an initial um, execution constraint uh, equivalent to this um, top left constraint. Um, the one difference is the L of M and the 2 L of N. Those are the latencies through the memory and through the connection network. Um, so those are just constants depending on how you build up your network, the number of delays through that network and through the memory. Uh, a lot of times in FPGAs, uh, the latency through a RAM block will just be like one or two, depending on how you design it. Uh, the latency through the connection network is generally related to how big that network is. So if uh, K is uh, four, it's usually like on the order of log two or um, so the second for loop is basically going through those execution times and getting rid of any um, states that are sort of impossible, one where uh, output node 2 attempts to execute before output node 1, for instance. We don't want that to happen because we've assigned what the output sequence we want is. It also um, makes sure that output node 1 doesn't execute at the same time as output and so after going through that second loop, you could still have the case where there's a gap between the output nodes. And the third loop basically removes that gap by starting at the final output node, because that's your, your last constraint that you can possibly, um, that's the last node has to execute at that time, and then moving all the other constraints, delaying them so that they all execute as a group. And I'm not going to go through the proof, but basically the proof attempts to um, contradict that, to try to find an execution schedule that um, still meets the constraints with less latency. And it's possible to prove that that doesn't exist, and this is the best one. That you can do. So now that you have found uh, the execution times, you know what the latency is, because the latency is just going to be the execution time of the first output node. And 
that is equal to L on the graph. And you can uh, sort of look at this as a how much data is in your system. So when you first start, you have zero uh, data elements in your system. After uh, you get k data elements, the stream length per clock, and so your slope is k until a time l, at which point you start getting k samples out each clock period. So your maximum number of data elements in the system is k times l, and you have k data uh, memory arrays, k memory arrays, um, so each memory array needs to be, uh, have a depth of L. Okay, so basically implemented all this in actually in MATLAB, and the MATLAB takes in, as I mentioned before, uh, the particular permutation that you want to implement um, the streaming with, and spits out some HDL code that can be implemented in both either an FPGA or ASIC type digital circuit. So we're primarily looking at latency in this example, and so um, here are two graphs with uh, results with different streams with different stream widths, 2 and 16, and um, this was for the stride permutation, which a lot of other papers use the stride permutation, so we use that for comparison purposes. Um, so the two main people I had results for a comparison were Puchel's in the red slash dark orange. I should change that. They like switched. Anyway. <laughs> um, and, and Milder's. And Puchel's work requires that the stream width and the permutation size be powers of two, as I sort of mentioned earlier. Uh, Milder's work does not require that, but um, in general, it requires about twice as much memory as some of the other approaches out there. And we see that in terms of memory for the um, stream width of two, this approach um, required has, uh, is faster than some of the other ones. Um, when you move to permutation or stream width of size 16, you start to see a little bit of dis discrepancy uh, below about 100. Um, permutation size of 100. And the reason for that is because uh, Puchel actually is able to optimize the uh, connection network a little bit better than I did here. And that um, I used a very general connection network based on some work in the early, late 60s in um, the telecom industry on switching networks. And so he uh, builds up his um, network from scratch based on some of the properties of the particular permutation that he's looking at. And so in those very small permutation sizes, those connection networks have very low latency, very low counts in LN. And so that's why um, you see his results uh, beating you for the low N sizes. And then when you get bigger, those, those are still, it's the same constant latency over regardless of the permutation size for those connection networks. And so as the permutation size gets much bigger, um, my reduced latency through the memory starts to um, overcome that difference. So what is the permutation size of interest to, to you, let's say, if you want to design the system? So what, what's the range? For permutation size and stream width? So it's sort of like uh, stream width is really dependent on your throughput. So to, to give you an indication, um, let's see, a, a size k equals 16 might be equivalent to a throughput of, let's see, like 4 giga samples per second data rate, um, while uh, k equals 2 is more equivalent to like 500 mega samples per second. Because typically clock rates on a lot of these devices hover around maybe 250 megahertz maximum. Yeah? What's the difference between throughput and bandwidth? Uh, they're very similar. I mean, bandwidth in a like, uh, wireless communication system is a little bit different. Um, a lot of times in sort of a data processing aspect, I would say they're roughly the same. 
say nine minutes left. <laughs> I'll probably be faster than that. <laughs> okay. Um, so sort of in summary, that was, that was the latency results. These are sort of uh, more general results. So on the top table, this is sort of the requirements that this approach requires. It requires um, the memory array of um, k elements, each of depth d, which um, regardless of the permutation type, you can show that it's always going to be less than or equal to the permutation size divided by the stream width k. And then um, all of the lookup tables to control both uh, the addresses for the memory array and the connection network settings at each time step. Um, let's see. And then below that, uh, we compare some of these aspects to some of the other related works in this field. Um, probably the most relevant comparisons are uh, the paper by Chen and Milder. They both um, support the arbitrary permutations that the, these do. Uh, you can see that in terms of number of RAM, uh, it's equivalent to Chen's at uh, size of k RAM elements, while Milder takes 2k elements. Um, the memory depth is smaller than both Chen's and Milder's, and the number of switches is less than Chen's and equivalent to Milder's, which also use the same type of network. Um, Bouchelle's is a very um, elegant, nice method uh, for the most part in terms of uh, number of RAM elements and memory depth and uh, switches for the most part too. But as I said before, it only handles power of two um, permutations. And specific, it's not only power of two, there's a further limitation that I don't want to get into here, but it, it's something called bit index permutations which dried is one particular uh, bit index permutation. And then Chen has another uh, stride permutation as well. Uh, so at this point, I was going to go talk to you about um, the topic that Ted brought up about um, combinations as well. I think I'm going to skip that in the interest of time. Let's see. So, um, so I sort of talked to you about how you would implement permutations in sort of an automated fashion. And one of the things that maybe you gleaned from that last slide or two was that uh, one of the big aspects that are very costly are these uh, control structures, the lookup tables for controlling the addresses and the connection networks. And so future directions for this might be to try to reduce those control costs. So they were just stored rather simplistically. Uh, simply in these big lookup tables. If it's possible to generate these in a more online fashion, that would be better. Um, depending on the particular algorithm, it might take way less space. And Pichot has shown that that's possible for those particular types of log2 permutations, but um, no one has been able to show lower control costs for more arbitrary permutations. So that would be very helpful. Um, the second thing is multi-objective optimization. So it would be you know, we minimize the latency and the memory depth D, but if it were possible to maybe slightly increase the latency and get much less control costs, that would probably be worth it in a lot of aspects for a lot of applications. So if it was possible to optimize these jointly, that is another thing looking into. Um, so that's pretty much it. If anyone really wants to know, we can talk about the combinations and, and how to handle that sort of thing.